My name is Ian Stocks. I'm a taxonomic entomologist with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Division of Plant Industry in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, the groups that I'm responsible for are the scales, mealybugs and their relatives, and the allorotidae, which are the white flies. Let's, um, let's go ahead and, and uh, go to, uh, um, uh, we're going to go down, we're going to change couplets again, but we're going to go to uh, the Pseudococcus longispinus. This is the long-tailed mealybug. So let's go ahead and get that one on the slide um, and start, we'll, again, we'll start with 4X. And this will be plate three. Okay, we all set up about about four uh, X lens on the long tailed mealybug. Okay, so let's um, we're going to go back to the first couplet again because we're going to start with antennal count. So we go up to go up to uh, maybe ten X here and bring it into into focus, and just pick a side and just convince yourself that there are um, there are eight distinct segments. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and there's absolutely no hint whatsoever that there's any kind of subdivision there in that terminal or eight segment. Okay. And this is, this is going to be the most common count um, for segments. All right, so that's going to drop us down now to, uh, to couplet um, number three. Okay. And but we're, before we go to, before we go um, through the steps in the couplet, we're going to do a little tour of the morphology here to get our bearings again, okay? So as I move from the anterior to the posterior uh, region of the mealybug, we can pick up the eye, the, uh, the mouth parts there in the middle, of course the, uh, the base of the leg, okay? And while we're on the leg, let's go out to the claw, go to 20X, Okay, so do we all have the uh, claw in focus now? Yeah. All right, and if you need to, you can go to 400X um, just to convince yourself that as you, uh, you know, go through the focal um, planes here and, and, and look at the inner margin, there's no hint of a claw there, okay? All right, so even though that's not really necessary for where we are in this couplet, it's a, another character to bear in mind, okay? So we'll go back out to uh, 10X here. And we're going to scroll down all the way to the posterior end here. All right. And then my, I'm at 10x here. Get our bearings a little bit. This structure here is the vulva. It's a little blocked up here, but that's where it should be. Here's the anal ring. Okay the anal lobes here. And remember there was a key, uh, there was, a, there was a, uh, uh, a character state in the first couple we went through that discussed anal bar. Um, here's an example of an anal bar here. Now in, in Pseudococcus longispinus, it may not always be that obvious because the other thing that's characteristic of, of Pseudococcus longispinus is that for this lobe to be quite heavily sclerotized, and that can sometimes block its presence, but in, in the genus um, uh, Planococcus, for instance, it's not so, and it's, it's, it's very obvious when it's there. Um, we can also pick up on the osteoles again here, okay, just slightly anterior of the vulva, and on this side here. And then we can also start evaluating for sororius. So here's the next one, one there, okay. Um, just another couple of things for regional morphology here. We're going to go a little bit more in the anterior direction. I'll go pull out uh, to 40 here. So this is the third pair of legs. If you come down about three or four segments, there's the circulus. So this is one of the circuli types that's called divided. It's fairly large. 
and there's an intersegmental line that traverses it, so that's called a divided circulus. Okay. Now, before we start counting things, I just want to make a, another kind of character uh, clear. And we have a 10x here. I want you to go to the body margin, find the sororius, so you'll have fairly prominent sororian sedi, or the sockets of the sedi. And change the yes, change the lensing here. That'll help a lot. Okay, so these mounds here are the sorari. Okay. And then just on the um, uh, uh, medial margin of that sororius, I want you to look for these duct structures here, these tubes. Okay? And then go up to, say, 20x. Okay? We're going to try a different, couple of different lenses uh, settings here. First of all, you can tell that there are two different sizes. There's a larger one here, and it's flanked by two smaller ones. Okay, now you can just about perceive it in this one here, but you can see that there's actually a washer-like structure um, at one end of it. Now you can move around on the slide a little bit until you um, encounter, because these are widely distributed, so you can kind of move around on the slide a little bit until you um, find slightly different positions of it. Here's one where it's a little bit more clear that there's a, uh, a, a more solid sclerotized structure associated with it. That's it in cross view there. And they become very clear when you find them in um, dorsal ventral view. And here's one on the screen right now. That one you can see it's a very distinct so this is it with a slightly different lighting setup. I don't know if that helps a little bit there. Now, what you can do is, is, is move along the specimen on the margin um, for each sororius and evaluate the presence of those oral rim ducts. Okay? You, don't, it, you don't have to worry so much for right now that it has two sizes, just that they're there. Okay? All right? So that's actually the first uh, the first component of the couplet for the long-tailed mealybug, longispinus. Okay. The other thing that's important to look uh, at for this one, and it's actually in the key here, um, trying to get a good picture on the screen, is that the sororius um, has not just the sororian CD or the sockets um, that indicate that they're there. It has a concentration of trilocular pores. And characteristic of the genus Pseudococcus and uh, um, the related genus Dismacoccus is that it has what are called auxiliary seedy. Okay, and they are uh, pictured in um, uh, figure number two of, of plate three. Okay. Now they may break off also and just leave evidence of their presence by a slightly smaller socket, but usually with, um, with a good number of, of sorari, you'll find at least some sorari with the auxiliary seedy. Um, let me see if I can go up and here, that might help, we go up to 400 there. There we go, oh, that's pretty good right there. All right, so this is a really good, uh, really good um, sororius here. There's, there's a, a distinct mound-like structure, the conical sorari and seedy. There's a pair of them, a concentration of trilocular pores, and one, two, three um, wispy uh, flagellate-type seedy. Those are called auxiliary seedy when they occur on the sororius. Now you can bring into view the fact that it has um, a very prominent large oral rim, like in figure three of plate, uh, plate three, and then the pair of smaller oral rims there. And you get a really good sense of the fact that it's got a, uh, a washer structure there. Okay. 
Also, these oral rim ducts will be more widely distributed over the dorsum as well. Um, the regional distribution of oral rim ducts is a species level character for many genera. Um, so there are sort of generally distributed over the dorsum in Longispinus. Uh, other species may have none distributed over the dorsum, restricted to the serrari or some subset of the serrari. Okay. Now let's see. Okay. All right. So the next, so we've, we've established that there are oral rim ducts. Um, uh, with each sororius uh, having an oral rim duct and two smaller rim ducts, it has um, paired sororian CD and smaller flagellate CD. So now let's see, and we've also found um, the anal bar. So what we're going to do now is, is go down in magnification to the very posterior again. We'll find the anal lobes, the anal ring, and the region where the vulva is. Okay. Because again, if we were going to if we were going to search for multilocular pores, um, if they're going to be anywhere, they're going to be around the vulva, which is on the ventral surface, um, around the eighth segment, so near near the very end. And for Pseudococcus longispinus, they are not that abundant. So, let me see if I can get the. back down here. There we go. That's better. There's the vulva. Okay, if I focus in a little bit, and I can pick up um, just sort of peripherally to the, uh, um, the vulva uh, a, a relatively small number of multilocular pores. Okay? But if I try to go um, find them further than, say, the uh, segment um, just the anterior or uh, or further forward, they aren't there. Okay. So in Pseudococcus longispinus, the multilocular pores are are, are restricted to the area just um, to the edges of the vulva. Uh, other species have them uh, more widely distributed all the way up to the uh, first segment of the uh, uh, abdomen. Now, the very last character we want to look at um, is one of the most challenging to find um, and can vary, it, whether we see it or not, can vary quite significantly with the manner in which the specimen is prepared um, and also with the lighting parameters of a scope. So I want you to pull out on the magnification until you find the, um, the third um, leg segment. Okay, the third, I mean, sorry, the third legs. Okay, and find the first segment of the leg. Okay, this is the one that articulates with the ventral body wall. This is the coxa. Okay, right here. Okay. Uh, also, just by way of explanation, this sclerotized spur here is the coxal process. It doesn't figure very much into uh, the taxonomy. Um, but there are occasionally some characters associated with it. The next segment in the leg is the trochanter, fairly small. And then the next fairly large segment is the femur. Okay, and it's the femur and the next segment, the tarsus, that we want to pay some attention to. We'll come back to that in a minute. And the last articulating structure is the uh, uh, tarsus here with the tarsal claw. Now at 10x, get the distal portion of the tibia in view. So we're going to look around in this area right here, okay? All right. Now you're not really going to find much um, at this magnification, so you're going to have to go up to about 20x, so 200. Bring it back into view again. And I can see it um, under just general lighting here. But what we're looking for are what look to be white or clear dots, um, roughly circular in shape, 
um, though not as perfectly circular as, say, a socketed CETA, but associated with no CD. So I can see them here. There's a small patch of those dots right here, but there's also some other CETL sockets nearby for me to compare them to and see that they're different. All right. Now, I'm going to go up one more power here to 400x, because this is where you can really um, see them as, as a bit more distinct. And I'm going to have to change the lighting here. Now they've popped right out. Okay, All of these white dots here that are half the size um, or so of the cetal sockets, which are there, well, there's one, there's one. These are the translucent pores. Okay, Translucent pores are restricted to adult females. Okay, but they're not always present at the species level. Some species have them, some species don't. So you can't look for translucent pores, say, oh, they're not there, uh, it's not an adult. The other thing is that they are restricted to the third leg, even in the adult. So when they're present, they're found only on the third leg in adult females. Now, if we go back up again to the coxa, some genera, some species have translucent pores on the coxa. Some genera with some species, but very, very uncommonly have them on the trochanter. And when they're present, they're most frequently present either on the femur, okay, there's a couple of them here, and or the tibia right in here, okay. Now, this can be a challenging character to see, as I indicated, sometimes depending on the quality of the slide mount. But usually, if you've got to a key step where it says to be looking for translucent pores on the femur or the tibia, if you play around with the lighting a little bit, you can usually find some kind of lighting set, uh, setting or focus that will get at least a couple of them to pop out. The other thing too is if it says they're if they're going to be if, if the species in question is diagnosed in part by having them on the femur and the tibia, if they're and if you're finding them just on the tibia, um, then you should be finding them on the femur if they're there. Okay, so if they're not there, it's something else. Yeah, since we're we're not going through every sp species in this key, um, the the for when it comes to the translucent pores. The specimen that this is contra the species this is contrasting is the genus Paracoccus species marginatus. Paracoccus, um, uh, the species generally have a very high concentration of very obvious translucent pores on the coxa. Okay. So since they're absent from this specimen, it can't be a Paracoccus marginatus. But part of the species diagnosis for Pseudococcus longispinus is translucent pores on the tibia and translucent pores on the femur, even though that's not stated explicitly in the key step there. Okay? So now we've gone through and we've, we've again, validated uh, character by character that this is consistent with um, uh, uh, Pseudococcus longispinus. Okay?